Welcome back to another edition of the Human Advisor Podcast. I am your host, Tyrone Ross. The rules of engagement, you know them, run to YouTube, subscribe, like, share. We appreciate you for doing so. What you are about to see is my conversation with Kathy Curtis of Curtis Financial Planning. In our walk and talk, Kathy goes into deep detail about how she started her firm, why she started her firm, and as she says, why she works with independent women. Also, following that conversation in our sit down, we really get into how she utilizes technology to free herself up to work with what she describes as her wealth management clients. As we know in this business, wealth management takes on a whole term, but you'll be really interested to hear how she breaks down what a wealth management client means to her and who she serves and why. Here's some highlights from that conversation. I appreciate you. I am so glad that I took this path into individual personal advice, straight on to individuals, helping them with their everyday issues, and really feel like I'm making a difference in people's lives, not just making a ton of money for another corporation. So let's talk a little bit about the origin of Curtis Financial Planning, sure. who you serve, why you serve them. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really unique that you, you know, you have, you say you serve independent women. Right. So let's talk a little bit right. about that. Yeah. So I started my firm oh, 15 years ago and um, I did it because I was in corporate America. Okay. And I was so tired of being, having bosses, selling products that didn't mean anything and didn't change the world. Right, and, right. Um, I always loved personal finance and I even invested in stocks from when I was really young. And I decided I'm gonna just go on on my own. I didn't work for another firm. I, I don't know why I chose such a hard way to do it, but I did. Right. And I, um, I went independent solo right from the very beginning. And I didn't work with women only um, from the start. Okay. It was maybe five years in that I realized if I didn't do something dramatic, right, right, my firm right. was going to fail. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I mean, I'm a woman, right? right. I experienced all these things um, in the workplace that other women did. I could really relate. I had built my own financial situation really well. I was good okay. with money. I, I just kind of have the gene. Okay. And so I thought, I'm going to sh try working with women only and right. see what happens. Right. And my firm just took off. Wow, that's amazing. Now, was there any pushback initially that you, that for industry wide? Obviously, I'm sure women loved it. Yeah. Because uh, I always talk about how women are great. They talk about a good experience or whatever. Men, right. are, men not so much. Yeah. But was there, you know, was there pushback from you know, when you had the idea from, you know, obviously the industry stalwarts and people that have been around? Or was right. it just like once you no. decided to do it, it was off and running? It was off and running. So I, the first thing I w did was build a really cool website that okay. spoke to women okay and the industry loved my website it right. was unique it right. was colorful it was it was nothing like yeah advisor so, so, websites. yeah so let's stay there right yeah, when, yeah. You, when you say it spoke to women yeah. right like what 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 was the purpose and intent that went into building the website so that when women go there they say okay this is where I want to be it's right. where I want why I want to work where right so first off it was bright green and pink and black okay <laughs> that'll <laughs> and do most it most advisor websites were blue white yeah showing white couples looking at paper <laughs> and, Talk about um, it. and I decided I want I didn't want images because I was sick of the industry images like that Ooh, so I used um, graphic design like images not real pictures that was right. unique that was right. different the colors um, I said something about finance doesn't have to be scary because a lot of women are afraid yep. of money yep and uh, it was the the website was so unique that it started to attract attention right away. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, coinciding with building a website, I started using social media. Okay. This was back in 2008 when nobody was doing it yet, at least advisors. Yeah. Advisors yeah. weren't. I see, wait, 20,000 followers on Twitter? No. So, no. No? I think I'm almost 11,000. 11,000? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. close. that's more than me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get there, believe me. You will get there. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. You're going to so have was, so, the, so the social media push was purposeful as well. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it, it was kind of like a marketing campaign. I didn't know what I was doing, though. It just, right. it kind of happened organically. But 
media types and marketing people started to notice my website. And they tweet, I love your website, what are you doing? And it all, I met some really cool people. Um, Jim Pavia from CNBC, yep. I met him early on. He was on Twitter early on. And um, I just kind of got recognized for having a unique marketing approach. Right. And so I didn't get any pushback at all. Right. In fact, people were like, wow, this is cool. She's marketing to women. She's got a great website. And it kind of went from there. Awesome. So when we sit down, I definitely want to dig a little bit more into the why, right? Why you serve that particular demographic, what the experience has been like. Yeah. And then obviously we can share with, you know, not only the advisors out there, but just people in general, how dialing into a particular, I, call, I say niche once you actually found it, when you're yeah. looking for it, it's a niche. Yeah. Um, when you find that, you can actually drill down, you can do really good work in this business. Yeah, so looking forward true. to that. And you know, having a, a more robust conversation. We'll see you guys on the other side. All right, so we are sitting down now at the beautiful Diplomat Hotel here in Hollywood, Florida. I am with my guest, Kathy Curtis of Curtis Financial Planning. Thank you for being here. Thank you, I'm excited. So we need y'all to focus here and not on all the palm trees and everything <laughs> behind us, please. We'd appreciate that. Um, so again, thank you for being here. Yeah. I, I, I can't wait to dig into so many different things, uh, learn more about you and, and, you know, as we mentioned previously, just really getting into um, the, the particular area of focus that you have in your practice and why. Yeah. So let's just, let's just start right off with you. Tell okay. us a little bit about you, how you got here, okay. um, and why we're so privileged to have you. Oh gosh, okay, well thank you. Uh, well, how I got here, I was invited on this podcast. <laughs> um, I think I have kind of an interesting story to tell, tell in, in the financial services realm. First off, I was uh, a career changer Okay. Started my own firm from scratch, and early, on, fairly early on, decided to focus on women clients, okay. and that was for a number of reasons, not the least of which was women were underserved a bit by the industry. Okay. There, there's there weren't a lot of women advisors when I started, and I hate to say it, there's not a lot of women advisors now. now. Yep. I mean, the number is like 20 percent. I hear 20, maybe 25 percent, and. Um, I'm not saying anything against male advisors. They're awesome male advisors, but sometimes women want to talk to another woman about personal stuff like their money. And I just saw it not only as a need of women clients, but as an opportunity for me to be able to build a clientele in this huge world of personal finance where I was this little fish in this gigantic pond. Right. How was I going to compete? How was I going to grow my business? Yeah. So those are some of the reasons why I decided to market to women specifically. And my business took off as soon as I made that decision. Right. And um, I think it wasn't because only because women were flocking to me. It's because when you choose who you want your client to be, it's so easy to speak to them. In your marketing materials, on your website, you know where to spend your time when you go out. Yeah. Um, what what communities to join, all those things, yeah. and so my time was better spent. Um, this wind, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it, and it was fun. It became really fun. Right. And of course, when your business starts to grow, that's right. that's a great thing. So two things there. One, you mentioned career changes, right? And yeah. I think a lot of financial advisors are career changers. Before I went into this business, I was a juvenile probation officer. Oh, right? okay. And yeah. also pairing that with the fact that when you decide who you want your client to be, as I always say, is we bring a lot of ourselves to our practice. Right. And a lot of your 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 practice and your, your book of business, or however we want to say it this week, um, starts to mirror you in terms of your interest and things that you really care about, obviously being a woman and, and having, you know, uh, a firm for, for women. But let's just kind of take a step back, like some of some of the steps that you took that actually that have gotten you here, yeah, right? right. Um, and go back as far as you want, but just talk about how, you know, the steps that led you to ultimately, you know, running your own firm and sure. specifically, as you mentioned, which I love for independent women. I, lo I love that description. Yeah. Well, I'll go way back. Do it. And you had mentioned something when we talked before this call about my important papers. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Let's so, go there, too. And I mentioned this on my website. <clears throat> I keep it on there because people love it. They, yeah. they say, oh, I loved your important papers. So my dad was my idol growing up, and he was a businessman. And he paid all the bills in the house, traditional household. Mom yeah. didn't do anything with the money. Dad managed everything. And he would sit at the, di the living room table and do his bills. And so I would watch him do that. And 
I decided to create this game called Important Papers, which kind of emulated what my dad did in paying awesome. all the bills. That's awesome. So from really early on, this thing about being in an office <laughs> <laughs> was really intriguing to me. Right. And like even, um, and then growing up, my, my sister, I have five sisters and brothers, grew up in a big Catholic family in San Francisco, okay. Sunset District, totally middle class. Okay. Um, my sister would go off to camp and, and I'd get summertime jobs in an office. <laughs> I'd work downtown San Francisco, wow. like filing papers, whatever. And all through college, I went to UC Berkeley. I worked at an office. I worked at the School of Public Health, helping this um, amazing woman um, to be, a, I had some great mentors too in, yeah. in the business world. Yep. And I, that's just kind of who I was. I like business. Okay. And okay. so I stayed in business. I had a, a career before this one in um, the food industry, in marketing and sales. But I, I got tired of um, not feeling like what I was helping people. Like I was selling product, I was good at it, helping companies make profit. But what was I doing for right. anybody? Yeah. I wasn't. Yeah. And so I kind of flipped my hobby of investing personal finance into my career decided to start my firm. Wow. Took off from there and I it was the best decision I could have made. Not easy. Right. Lots right. of roadblocks and stumbling and all that along the way but right. yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. And and again the the other piece that we you know there's a theme here that I like to talk to people about is your first memory of money, right, and, yeah. and your relationship with that important papers, right? right? Putting that so many years later, right, that being a cornerstone of what you put on your website and your bio, yeah. um, I think is a, is a really fascinating thing. But let, let's go a layer deeper there with that. Obviously, you, you mentioned something as well. It's like you had always been good with money and you kind of figured out your own situation. Yeah. Do you think that was kind of the seed there that watching your dad and then starting that game for yourself or whatever, is that something that you bring into conversations with clients to oh, get them absolutely. to understand you do, you yeah. do, okay. Well, okay, so going into my niche a little deeper, yeah, it connects, yeah. Yeah. Um, I started out women, that's pretty broad, right, 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 right. So over time I've narrowed, 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 and now I like to work with single women, okay, or women-led households who are looking for a female advisor. Mm. I really like the one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Couples, it's like your attention is split, there's conflict, with, with a single woman, I do my best work. It's just, I'm like that in person too. I like one-on-one -on -one wow, interactions okay. rather than big group. Right. And so, and then I come to find that most of the women that were finding me are single. It was, it's just like this natural thing. They, they're either single by choice, single from divorce, widowed. I have several wid widow clients um, in partnerships, but single. And so, and, I was single, I was a, a little bit commitment phobic, and so I didn't get married until a little later than a lot of people. Right. And I built up my own wealth before I got married. Wow. I owned um, two houses, I bought a condo first, then I bought a home, um, I grew my 401k, I was, I was just good was, yeah. with money. Right. And so I bring that to my awesome. single clients, that yeah. It doesn't matter if you don't have a partner, you can do all this on your own with these simple tools and methods and you know the simple truths about money right. that exist. Right. You right. can be financially successful too. So I definitely think that my who I am really comes to the party. Right. Like all advisors. Yeah, we bring of course. who we are. Yeah, bring who you are to. Yeah, right? yeah absolutely. Yeah. Now that now that's fantastic to talk about that. Couple things there. One, you're saying mostly single women, which is amazing. Yeah. And then what I love about these conversations is you're taught, especially I came up in the wirehouse, is you want both spouses there, you want two people, right? right. Um, so that's one side of it. And the other thing is what I want to ask you is because the other piece is they tell you, well, don't ignore, don't ignore the wife if, if, you, yeah. if the main contact was the man, yeah. right? Um, but what have you found that you feel that myself and other advisors are missing, right, when it comes to working with women as clients. Like, what is it, what can the industry do better, or should it be more attentive or aware of, not to take your clients or, yeah, and no, things no, on your, not but at just, all. but There's I just think, clients. yeah, I just think we can provide better service, and I think dealing with people and getting the advice from people who are dealing with that demographic specifically yeah. and know it well would serve us all better in just providing better ongoing service. So what is the industry missing, or what can we do better yeah, that you've seen in your Yeah, that's such an interesting question, because because 
the male female dynamic so interesting like a lot of husbands make the mistake of their wife comes to them with a problem instead of just listening they want to fix it yeah, immediately yeah. we're fixers <laughs> yeah and then but then you take the financial planning relationship and you you're supposed to be a fixer right so you know how do yeah, you reconcile yeah, all yeah. that so but i think the key one is listening first okay listening before you start giving advice or interrupting or saying why did you do that or maybe you should do it this way is really listening and i mean I, that's one of my skills is I'm a really, really good listener. Okay. So I think that that works with my women clients. Okay. And um, don't criticize what they did before. Oh. I've had women clients come to me and say, I hired this guy. And the first thing he did was look at my portfolio and go, oh my God, who told you to do that? Or, and pisses them off right. it's like because maybe they didn't make the decision maybe an advisor made the decision but it's still their money and it's yep. still something they agreed to so you don't criticize something something that did. I have to stop myself sometimes too so I'm not perfect because <laughs> I see something right that, right right, <laughs> like, oh right. My God. what are you doing yeah. This? yeah but you have to keep that quiet yeah. and, and just know that you're going to improve the situation I think right. so I think it's the, the interpersonal skills and um, women and this is talked a lot about well about a lot now. Um, women care less about investment returns and more about how what you're doing for them planning wise is going to work for their life and their families, you know? And and are things going to be okay? Women worry about being bag ladies and things like that. They yeah. really do. Yeah. I mean, they have a lot of disadvantages when it comes to money. Like um, they're in and out of the workforce because of day child care and then and then elder care too. They usually take the lead role. They make less money a lot of times. All those things make them feel insecure. So if you, anything you could do to help them feel secure, and it doesn't have to be, I'm going to get you a 10% return annualized. Right. You know, it's right. good planning. So th that's the actual um, soft skills, yeah. right? That that I think again we could all do better at. But you mentioned also how you present your firm, right? The, the marketing, the branding, yeah. right? Yeah. And again. I don't think anyone is going to run out and change their whole website to just to get more women. But what, what do you feel in terms of context that things that women appreciate when they go to a website or they or they go to uh, they, they see you on social media, any type of branding again that, that right. folks should be more aware of? Well, they want to see themselves for one, just like okay. anybody. So yep. if you're using imagery on your website, use imagery that represents the client you want to work with. Amen. You know? I mean, that's that's as simple as it gets. Right. And I think I don't know if advisors are, I'm not sure about the state of advisor websites. They used to it used to be bad. I think there's a lot of really good marketing people out there yeah, that are developing yeah. some really cool websites. So yeah. I don't think that's such an issue anymore. And then if you do write like if you write a blog, use social media, figure out what the pain points are of your client and write about them. Yeah. I write about stuff that women care about a right. lot. And I think that's another way. Don't, don't, if you really want a niche market, don't go broad. Go, go smaller and smaller and smaller. Really, really. Yeah. And what have, what have, what have you found that has been the most effective for you? Is it the blog? Is it, is it Twitter? Is it speaking? Like what, what yeah. is, is it, um, is it the blog? Writing. I love to write. Writing yeah. is great. I should do more video. I yes. know that. Yes. That is on my list. Okay. Because when I have done video, it's it works, and I, I don't know why I don't do it. I yeah. guess because who wants to be on camera? <laughs> <laughs> Fair. You never Fair. know how yeah. you're gonna look on camera. <laughs> but no, I think video is fun, and I I think people really respond to video probably okay. more than than writing. Yeah, I mean, was, they do. People and people's yeah. attention spans are so short now. Who's yeah. reading old blog posts? Yep. Yeah. Whereas you flip on a video, if there's something that catches your eye, you might keep watching it. But right, right now, I do, I public speak, I blog, I use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. But the, the truth is, my over the years, my SEO has gotten so good Amazing. that I get people, women finding my website because of Google search. So it's just like a compilation of all these things that I've been doing all these years. And the perfect client will go on to my time trade thing, book an appointment, right. and I'll talk to her on the phone. I'm like, this is a miracle. Right. I'm actually right. attracting exactly who I want to attract. Fantastic. So that, that is a, a perfect way to pivot into this. So by the way, before we get there, you don't have to worry. Human Advisor Podcast viewers watch until the very end, right? <laughs> um, but great pivot because 
all right, I reach out to you. I read your blog post. I want to reach out. I want to work with Kathy. What does that look like? Right. Take me through the process okay. of I walk into the door. I'm a man, but right, right, just pretend right. I yeah. switched up. <laughs> uh, what, 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 is, what is that experience like when I when I walk in and I sit with you? OK, so first off, the phone call um, screams that, that yes, first. we are a good fit. OK, so the first, yeah. okay, that's the first thing. We're a good fit. I can provide to you the service that you want. You can provide to me my needs to run my business. Okay. Right? OK, so that's number one. I rarely invite someone into my office unless I feel that's true. And that's because I'm a solo advisor. Okay. Um, I want to be really efficient. That's okay. key. And I also I don't want to disappoint people. I'm a soft touch. Someone comes into my office, I like them, then maybe they're not the perfect fit. I may take them on and then I'll regret it later because yep. I don't have time. Yep. Yep. It's time. I wish I could help everybody. Yeah. Okay, so they, they get into my office and I, I have a meeting without, they're not committed yet. Okay. And I talk to them. It, there's no papers, there's no computers. It's tell me about yourself. Um, I may have them bring in a tax return and some investment statements just really? to get a better okay. idea because you can okay. tell a lot from a tax yep. return. Yep. So I look at the tax return and it'll key off some questions. And really it's an hour of let me get to know you, take all kinds of notes. Mm -hmm. And and then sell myself, sell okay. myself and my services, get them comfortable with me, with my office. I always want them to come to my office and they leave after an hour and I tell them to think about it. You know, I tell I tell them I'd love to have you as a client and think about it and let me know. Usually within a couple of weeks, they come back and say yes, or maybe they don't. But OK. And if they're really uncertain because this is a big decision, I'll invite them back for a second meeting. I do a little more deeper thing in the second meeting. I'll take what I learned in the first meeting, turn it into this kind of money meeting chart okay. with the mind mapping software, and I'll talk to them about their situation a little deeper. Okay. Um, then they do or don't hire me. That's that's the steps in getting them to. Okay. Yeah, it's a kind of a it's a not a long sales process because okay. most people that come to my website kind of know they already they've read my website there's a I put it myself out there on my website it's pretty right. transparent okay and then um, I'm a, fin a financial planner centric advisor okay I give them a big long questionnaire all that stuff yeah the yeah, data yeah. gathering <laughs> I go into the data gathering phase yeah they fill it all out they come in for the first draft meeting and I take it from there awesome so awesome. The, the initial client engagement is probably like five meetings at most and then they go into my service my annual service model which is um, I, I do a couple value-added things a year I have two meetings a year okay uh, they I use e-money they use the client portal so okay. we're really engaged I have a very open door policy with clients they can contact me anytime they want okay all of my clients are full wealth management, financial planning, investment management. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Now, what is, because we, uh, I'm obligated to ask, yeah. what is the fee structure? Right? What is the, is that like? It is AUM. Okay. AUM. I've been through all kinds of fee structures. AUM. Why does that, why, why does that work best for you? Now, and I will go even deeper. Yeah. Do you find that works better with women? Or is it just uh, diagnostic? It works, you that's just, it works a really anyway. good question. Okay, I have to say that I turn away a lot of business who want financial planning only on an hourly or really? flat fee basis. What's the reason for that? Because I decided I can't do financial planning only and service all my wealth management clients well. Okay. Because I, I did that early on, but my business on the AUM side wasn't so big. When someone's paying you ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year, and you're distracted by a one-time client who only wants you for a few hours and you right. put all this energy into them. Fair. What's Fair. going on with what you're doing and thinking about for your other clients? It's Fair. a real conflict. Right. It's such a conflict. So in, in my mind, you either have that business or you hire someone to do that for you, which is an option for me. Right. I could hire someone to handle all those clients. Right. What I do is I refer them out to other the only advisors okay. that do Fantastic. flat fee and hourly. Okay. okay. And I know several in my marketing area that I l really know well, and I know they do great work, and I send them out, and I feel good about doing that. Right. And then I take on the clients that fit my business model. So it's because you know I'm a business person as well as a, a financial yeah. advisor. Yeah. Yeah. I have to run a good business, or I'm out of business. Right. 
that's how I think about it. Right. But this was not an easy transformation. I took on, I did more financial plans than you even want to know. In fact, I got burnt out and that's what changed my, the way I did business. I joined a coaching program. I, I just realized that I couldn't do that anymore. Right. So I'd be remiss if we didn't do this. So what's really important, you mentioned wealth management clients, yeah. right? And you mentioned the financial planning aspect, the investment management aspect. There are folks who are watching this who aren't financial advisors. Let's, let's talk about that. Okay. What, what is a wealth management client? What, yeah. like if, if someone's like, well, what does that mean? Okay, right? yeah. And how is that different from any? So, so go in, and to what it means to you, because we right. know what it means to our industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But explain like, what, what okay. it means to you to be a wealth management client at your firm. Right, right. Okay, so for me, a wealth management client is someone who needs and wants you and values you to do their financial planning mm -hmm. and all that entails, right? Right. Cash flow, estate planning, insurance needs, um, college education, whatever. Mm -hmm. You help them with all of those things, get those all in place and correctly, but you also manage their money to, to reach their goals, to reach all these goals on, on the financial planning mm -hmm. side. Okay, mm -hmm. I want to retire at 50. I want to send my kids to Ivy League school. I want to take a sabbatical and travel around the world. Well, you, you've got all those goals. You can, you can see whether they can do them or not with your software and your analysis. But the money's got to fund it. So you're over here then managing their money to a certain allocation to try and get a certain rate of return to feed those goals. Uh, so it all, it's yep, like yep. one big piece of their life that you're helping them with. Right. And, it, and it's completely together. Um, the people that hire me understand the value of that. And okay. that's why they're willing to pay the 1% right. AUM fee. Okay. They see the value. They don't complain about the fee. Um, it's an efficient way to bill, which is why I like it. OK, OK, fair. I mean, you, you're deducting it from the account. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to chase down money which I okay. do not want to do. Right. And it works for everybody. My invoices are completely transparent. Okay. I, I have a real issue with um, wirehouse statements where they have, the clients don't even know where the fee is. It's confusing as could be. I have to show clients yeah. what they're paying that yep. come to me from, I won't name names. Anyway, yeah. um, and so I not only have it on the first page of my reports, what was deducted for fee, but I have an actual invoice that shows them how it was calculated. That's awesome. So really, really transparent. I tell them that up front. They know. And, um, and if, if someone doesn't value it, they're not going to hire you. Yeah. If they don't, they don't see that they need both of those things or, or they want to pay that amount of money, right. then they won't hire me. Right. That's so, amazing. No, that, did, I, I, does that, did I do a good no, job No, that? you did. You absolutely okay. did. Yeah. I, and, and again, I think that that's what's most fascinating about this is that everyone runs their practice a different way. Yeah, but the, they the, do. the main the main thing though is to make it about the client. And yeah. there are a lot of ways to do that. And because there's so many of us that have so many different areas of focus, one, we need the broader community to understand that. Yeah. Right? That you would have you would have conversations with people on the street and they think, okay, well, I need a million dollars. I have to it's like no, right? No matter where you are in 2020, you can get advice from oh, somebody. Yeah, for right? sure. And it may not be an AUM based CFP. Yeah. It could be a you know a, a, a traditional financial advisor that does coaching or something like yeah, that. Yeah, there's so many. There's so many. So I so I love the fact that you actually went into the detail of what you do, how you do it, why you do it, and then and then you know the cherry on top saying is well, the clients love it, right? Yeah. Why they work with you, and if right. they don't, they won't. Yeah. And 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 the other thing that I love is this: I found the best financial advisors can outsource. They're yeah. like, I can't do that, but I know right. someone who does. Right. Because you, you realize then is, one, you free yourself up. Two, you're letting that person know, this is my particular area of expertise. It may not fit you, but I know someone that can fit exactly. you. And, and since they've come to you, you've, you've already had that first layer of trust with them. So you recommending somebody else, now that trust is transferred to whoever you said, right? right? Because you have, and, and one of the things I don't talk about, and I, and I, sh I wanna bring more light to is, all of my COIs are women and oh. black women. Oh, that's right? cool. And that's purposeful. Yes. Mostly because women get things done and they're punctual and, and <laughs> my clients love them. He's and speaking I, and, my language. Yeah, and I've, I've, had, I've had no pushback at all on that. Yeah. 
but it's one of the things that it was purposeful that I did that and I and I realized a long time ago and again I'm not a CFP I'm, I'm limiting the things that I have interest in and things that I want to talk to but I'm like if I take as much effort into building out my my COIs right my centers of influence right, people right. that I that I refer out to I'll end up being the rock star anyway because no, people go man true. I had a really good spirit experience with this individual oh, so the, the women that come to me and I refer out when I tell them you know what I I think you'd be better served by this type of advisor. I'm completely frank, and I refer. They are so grateful to that. I mean, right. th to, that's giving them something, too. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, they 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 don't have to go out and try and figure out who the best advisor is for them. Yep. And maybe make a big mistake because there are advisors that don't have the client's best interest in mind all the time. Right. You know. Yeah. So it is doing a big service, and and I'll have to say, I I not only won't do standalone financial plan anymore. I also don't do standalone investment management. Okay. Like okay. if someone comes to me and says, I have a million dollars and I just want you to invest it, I won't do it. Okay. Because I I don't feel competent if I don't do the full plan and know what return they need and what their situation is. I don't want to invest that money. I take that part really seriously. Right. So it's a full on thing or, or nothing. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So again, we, we just as I was telling you beforehand, the conversation just flows, right? So you, you mentioned a, a couple of things about how the, the, the tools that you use in order to work with clients. So let's yeah. get a little bit into that. Um, you know, obviously, tech is a really big part of this, oh, right? Yeah. But but let's really talk about how you integrate tech into your practice, right? And you oh, yeah. like from the even from the standpoint of how people actually book time with you, all the way to the point again, like you said, the mind mapping software, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and obviously, even you know, the endpoint being a, a platform like Altruist, right? What right. It, what does that look like for you in terms of the the tech stack and how you actually use that? to provide good service, but make sure it doesn't overwhelm the client experience. Yeah, oh God, I couldn't do what I do without technology. I mean, there's no way we would be able to run these small businesses, financial advising, investing, without the best technology. That's right. hands down. But, so it starts with the time trade thing. They book the, the appointment online, okay. comes into my calendar. I, I talk to the client. E-money, I use e-money. Okay. And, I don't use paper anymore. So, so technology has allowed me to com be completely paperless, even when it comes to engaging with the client. Um, and I have, I have some mastermind groups that are really shocked at that, that yeah. you don't use paper? And I said- Love it. It's evolved to the point where I've realized that my clients don't want paper. No. They nope. want me to look in the eye and talk to them. And then I use two big computer screens in my office to review the plan. And they're like, do they really like looking at computers? And I said, yeah, they really do. They right. do. Right. I have good screens. They're really close to it. I'm looking, they're looking. And I do the whole first meeting without giving them any paper. Wow. Talking about what I see, uh, what recommendations I have for them, all of that. Right. Without paper. And I'll say at the end, I have an overview here that I use. Do you want me, do you want a copy? Of it? Oh, no, no. I don't want a copy of it. Right. They don't want any paper. Right. What is yeah. that about? Yeah. <laughs> my, my, they hate it. To me, they, it means yeah. they're listening, they love what you're having to say, yep. and they're getting enough out of that yeah. right, personal Absolutely. engagement. Absolutely. They don't need, and they know themselves, they're gonna go home and they're gonna shove that paper in somewhere and they're never gonna look yeah. at it again. Again. Ever. Yep. Yep. So the whole, my whole process is like that. Okay. Um, if someone does want something in writing, I'll send it to them in a PDF. I don't know if they ever open it or not. Okay. Honestly, right. that, that's the way it is. Wow. I use um, hidden levers for risk tolerance mm -hmm. in IPS, in investment policy statements. Okay. I have the client sign off on that after I do their investment plan. I use Quanti because Quanti is a similar, uh, simpler um, profile I really like. Do you know Quanti? I don't. Oh, it's, so, don't. it's such good software. I don't. Highly recommend it okay. for portfolio management mm -hmm. stuff. Another thing that financial advisors, if they're running a practice, there's all of these pieces, oh, yeah. right? They get you distracted or whatever, and you may Report, be- Portfolio reporting software, yeah, yeah. billing software, yeah. mind mapping software, I mean- Right, and, and they're like, somewhere in there you got to service the client, right? Yeah. It's like you're trying to do all this stuff, this wi financial wizardry, yeah. and the client is over here like, hello, yeah. right? I would appreciate you know, your time and attention. That's why for me, anyone who knows me, who I fight for, what I care about right. is the end user, right? Yeah, and yeah. making sure that people, all people, all people deserve quality financial You're advice, right. regardless of zip code, color, denomination, creed, 
straight hair, curly hair. I agree. Everyone deserves it, and this is the, and this is the way to do it. Right, um, and that's one way that's going to make it happen because it is expensive to run a practice. Yeah, absolutely. It There's is. a lot of decisions and that have to be made. Depending where you live, cost yep. of living comes into play on what you charge. I mean, you otherwise you're out of business. Absolutely. Right. So yeah. this is an alternative that maybe more advisors can come into the industry. Yeah. You know, and to your point earlier, there are so many different types of advisors now that serve all kinds of communities in all different ways. Yeah. It's not just AUM anymore. Yeah. I mean, talk, we talked about AUM, but that's right. not what it's all about anymore. And, and, and as, we, as we pivot and we, you know, we, we, we kind of formulate the end of the conversation, a couple of things, I want to talk about the things that you do in the community and highlight that. Yeah, um, yeah. Don't remember the name of the organization offhand. Wait, yeah, talk a little bit about your work with that. Yeah, sure, that I found, I'd love I found to. that fascinating going on your website. So um, QUESA stands for the Center for Urban Education about Sustainable Agriculture. Okay. Uh, they're about to change their name. Thank you. So, <laughs> you don't have to remember that. So you don't have to remember right. that. But it's an um, organization that runs farmers markets in the San Francisco Bay Area, and they also do education about healthy food, um, land stewardship, you know, that, eating local, and um, also food justice, getting food to people who don't have access to good food. Yes. So lots of really awesome work in I the communities. It. It's it. such a I good organization. Awesome. The people have such heart that work there. I love it so much. Unfortunately, I've been there nine years. I'm terming off the board. Oh. I've been uh, board chair. Awesome. I w uh, was head of the marketing and I'm terming off, which makes okay. me really sad. But, right. but I, I love community work, but I also do. Do you know the Commonwealth Club of I California? Don't. I do. They're a huge public forum in San Francisco, um, been around for a hundred years, and they invite speakers of all different walks of life to come. Oh wow! And they have a their building is right across from the Ferry Building, San Francisco, mm -hmm. and I put on food programs. So food is big for me. I, okay. I it's kind of a passion. It was part of my old career, mm -hmm. and so I've tied my community work into food. Okay. And I do programs about food that include food justice and things like that. the good stuff about food, like the fun stuff, but also the serious stuff about okay. food okay. and the environment. I'm a big environmentalist. That's kind of why I headed that way okay. from the beginning. Best restaurant so. you've ever been to? Oh, God. Gather in Berkeley. Okay. Where is that? Berkeley, Berkeley. South of the campus. Okay. One of my favorite restaurants. Really? It's not a high-end gourmet. It's just really good just food. Really and good they food. care about where the food comes from. Okay. Gather. Gather. That's yeah, I love people it. People gather around the table. It's all about that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so here we here we go. So I, I, I um, this is probably my favorite part. Yeah. Um, so you know what's coming. Yeah. But but I, I definitely I definitely feel like being so purposeful in what you do and how you do it that you have a, a fantastic answer to so I can't wait to hear it. So share with us and with me um, and with all of your clients watching, what is the one thing that are you, you know, most grateful for that never worked out for you? Okay, I did think about it and it didn't take long to come up with it. So when it I- It usually doesn't, by yeah, the way. Yeah. When I was contemplating this career and I really wanted to be in finance, right? Um, I, I had this vision of myself walking down the street in New York in a beautiful, quality black suit, like this high-end investment banker type. Ah, uh, yeah. That's this vision I had. Sold the dream. <laughs> I don't know why I had that vision. Sold the dream, yeah. Yeah. And I am so grateful that that's not the path I took, because that would not have been me at all, at all. And I am so glad that I took this, career, this path into individual personal advice, straight on to individuals, helping them with their everyday issues, and really feel like I'm making a difference in people's lives, not making, just making a ton of money for another corporation. Right. So I, that's, I'm really grateful for that, because I, I could have done that. I could have gone that direction. Right. Yeah. And that's, again, I think that's the duality that you do have to face in this business is because yeah. when you when you see it from the outside and you start to get immersed in it, you realize what it they want you to look like right. and what it's supposed to look like and how it's supposed to be portrayed. But when you when you draw in and start to have a sense of self 
and you start to have a personality and you show that side of you in this business, look what happens, right? right you right. birth a firm, yeah. you birth a purpose, right. you birth a passion. Um, and like you said, the end result of what we're all trying to do and what I care about most is just pouring into people, pouring your experiences, all of you been through into people and then again using all of that all of the the financial tools and the tools and awareness and knowledge that we have to help people improve their lives yeah for uh, sure. it, it doesn't get much better than that it doesn't yeah i agree with you 100 well, well thank you so much for thank this you, this has, this has this been so has much been fun so much fun awesome thank awesome. you all right so here you have it thank you so much for tuning in again you guys the focus should be here not what's going on behind me <laughs> um if you are watching on youtube please subscribe like do all of that share stream and again as i say thank you for everyone that continues to share, uh, everyone that continues to send kind words. Uh, thank you to the whole team that puts this on. Uh, we are extremely grateful for every viewer and do understand that this is purposeful and um, there's a passion behind it to reach the people and tell these stories. And we are all so grateful, and I can speak for the whole team at Altruist, that you guys are tuning in and continue to share it. We will see you on the next one. I appreciate you. <laughs>